C-Suite's C-Suite Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Bruce Buchanan. I'm the director of the Business and Society program here at Stern. And as you can tell, I am terrible at following the script, so I'm just going to talk. <laughs> it's my pleasure tonight to be here with you and to welcome uh, Farooq Kathwari, uh, an alumnus of the school, class of 1968 MBA, to come back and speak with us and share his perspective and views. He's had an extraordinary career. Uh, he's currently chairman and CEO of Ethan Allen, a position he's held since roughly 1988. And I, to editorialize in an era when the average CEO tenure is about four years, maybe five, uh, he has held this job for three decades. Uh, that's that's long-termism. And again, to go off script, but I believe he is only the second CEO of, of Ethan Allen, so that's a firm which really believes in uh, CEO tenure. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, in addition to overseeing Ethan Allen, he lends his leadership skills to various humanitarian efforts, including the International Rescue Committee, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown, and he is a founder of the Kashmir Study Group. He is a recipient of three honorary degrees and has been recognized by Worth Magazine as one of the 50 best CEOs in the United States. Uh, we are at Stern tremendously proud of Farouk's accomplishments and very, very pleased that he's part of our community. And we welcome him here tonight. Uh, Farouk, was, Farouk is joined by my colleague and friend, Michael Posner. NYU Stern Professor of Ethics and Finance and, at, and the Director for the Center of uh, Business and Human Rights. Uh, Mike is recognized as a leader in advocating human rights around the world. Prior to joining NYU Stern, he served the Obama administration from 2009 to 2013 as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Uh, I, speaking for myself, we're just very fortunate at Stern to have someone of Mike's experience and caliber leading this effort for us here at NYU Stern, and I'm thrilled he's here tonight with us to engage Farouk in a uh, uh, pointed and insightful conversation. So without further ado, let me turn it over to these two fellows. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Bruce, uh, and thank you all for being here. I understand we're also being live streamed on Facebook, no, uh, YouTube Live. So uh, in, enjoy that. Um, Farouk, it's great to have you here. Um, we've met now a couple of times in the last six months. Uh, last fall when I attended uh, your big get-together with about 500 of your employees with a really spirited crew where you gave out awards to some of your best designers. And then you and I had a chance to spend a couple of hours a few weeks ago. And I wanted to, uh, so everybody, you're in for a treat here. Uh, Farouk is uh, not only a, a prominent business leader who's been incredibly successful, I want to talk about that, but also somebody who really views the world as a, as a concerned and involved citizen. So I want to talk about both of those things, but I really want to start a little bit by going back to how you got from where you started to, to here and to NYU. Um, you grew up in uh, a, just a part of the world that's had lots of challenges, lots of troubles, Kashmir. Give us a little flavor of your early years, what it was like growing up in Kashmir, some the relation with your family, and, and what it's like to be in a place like that where things are tense and not so easy. Well, first of all, uh, I'm really pleased to be here. It's a great pleasure always to come coming back to NYU. It almost looks like I never left. Now, I know how time flies. Huh? <laughs> now, I grew up, as you said, I was born in, in Kashmir. It is a beautiful land of mountains and great beauty, but unfortunately also an area of conflict. So we grew up in an area where our families were involved with uh, Kashmir arts and crafts. So I grew up looking my one my grandfather was involved with getting all arts and crafts from china to india to central asia and the other one was involved with the trade of pashmina shawl the wool so from mostly from tibet and central asia so i grew up there and my father got into politics he was a lawyer he had studied in um, punjab university in lahore and also did his masters at aligarh university in india but of course at that time it was uh, undivided india so I grew up 
in an area where our family was also involved in politics. And so we got separated, divided up. And so my mother didn't see two of her children for 10 years. My father was out of his home for 17 years. So we came in an area of conflict. But also uh, I decided to study literature and political science because my main subject was playing cricket. So if you're playing cricket, you don't want, you couldn't study medicine or engineering what like others were doing. And it was there that somehow I was involved with, uh, I met actually a journalist once coming from Delhi to Kashmir. Uh, there was a lot of trouble there and he was from the Washington Evening Star. And I asked him, who's going to take you around? I was 18. And he said, I don't know. I said, I will. So I got in a lot of trouble. But he then introduced me, another uh, one of your associates, Ambassador Schaefer, of which Schaefer I took him around too. And he, all of these folks helped me to come to America. So at age 20, I ended up here in New York. And I had applied for, uh, again, another story, but I did get got admission to, the, to, to, uh, to NYU. And I needed a job, so I had to work at night. Should I take this? That might be better. Because if I turn, it's probably, is this better? Yes. So, my, so I came to America with having studied political science and literature, but I didn't study much because I was playing cricket mostly. In fact, that by itself was a great education because I was explaining to him earlier that cricket, like un, unlike baseball, if you're a captain of the cricket team, you are playing with the team, you're strategizing, you are cheering. It's a very different training. So I was trained as a captain. Comes to New York and the first thing I asked at NYU was a cricket team. They said yes. So I joined it and six months later they made me a captain. But I needed a job so um, I saw an ad. It said bookkeeper near Canal Street. So I asked somebody what's a bookkeeper? Do I never seen a calculator in my life? They said don't apply. But I did and somehow I convinced them and I got a job as a bookkeeping in a small four person company. And I studied marketing because I first tried accounting, uh, uh, then economics, but marketing is what I liked. And I ended up um, uh, working with this little printing company. And after a year, this owner said, why don't you work on Wall Street? Because NYU Graduate School of Business used to be near Wall Street. So I went to the first building on Wall Street. And on 16th floor was Bear Stearns, got a job. As a junior financial analyst, of course, I had no idea what that job was about. And then a few years later, I became a chief financial officer of a leading Wall Street company. They didn't know I was studying marketing. So, <laughs> but at the same time, I had started a business because my grandfather had said on his own, 12 wicker baskets of arts and craft because they, they realized most probably I needed some help. They sell it, send us the cost, and... Uh, will help you in your schooling and your living in New York. So NYU at that time, we had a lecture from Marvin Traub. He was a head of uh, CEO of Bloomingdale's. I'd heard him, so I called him six or eight or ten times, finally asked me to see me, and Bloomingdale's became my customer, his arts and crafts. A few years later, I met the, the founder and chairman of Ethan Allen, and they became a customer. And then I decided that, and he asked me to join the company, and I convinced him that we'll have a joint venture. So I set up a joint venture, and that's how my career started uh, in the United States. So, Farouk, I'm not going to let you off the hook here when you're sort of describing each of these things. You said two things. You said you'd studied marketing and you liked that. And then you described one job after another that you applied for where you perhaps didn't have all the skills that were necessary. So let's go back to the bookkeeping job. You walk in and you say, <clears throat> you have a job for a bookkeeper. <clears throat> what, what did you do next? How did you get that job? And how did you, how did you manage to succeed? Well, when I went in first, uh, fortunately, I mean, I did not know this around lunchtime. So these folks were the two partners, Jesse Isaacson, Richard King. I've forgotten a million names, but those I remember. So there was a four-person, um, Sally was of those days called Gal Friday, and Abe printed the envelopes. So around lunchtime, the first thing he did was he put up a calculator 
It was a hand-operated calculator. Of course, I'd never seen it. To me, it looked like a big computer. So he took, took out the books and he said, can you foot it? I, you know, I, so I never heard that terminology, so I, was, I looked at him and said, what is in English? So he said, uh, where have you learned bookkeeping? I said, England. Then I had to you know, make it up. And the only thing in England I had done was change a plane. So impro being impro improvising is important. <laughs> and then, for, then he said, you know, you got to go to lunch, can you come back? And I said, I'll wait. So this lady uh, was looking at me and came over and said, I've been watching you, you know anything about bookkeeping? I said, no, but I need the job, can you teach me in 45 minutes? And she did. <laughs> so after 45 minutes, this came, people came in and they said, you know, uh, have you looked at the books? I said, yep, it needs, it needs some work. <laughs> and, uh, and I got the job and I learned, you know, because at that time, and same thing in Wall Street, when I went to uh, Bear Stearns, um, the director, his name was Jacobs. He looked at my application. Those days, of course, you could walk into any building, no, no security. So I walked in and he looked at my background and I had set for extracurricular activities, I had said mountain climbing. In Kashmir, it was going to school was mountain climbing. So he said, I love mountain climbing. I love Kashmir. I've got to get you a job. And he got me a job. And interestingly, being you know, somewhat of a novice, but I always was inquiring, so I would go to some of the senior partners, like Kohlberg, you know, later on set up KKR. I would say to them, I don't understand what you're doing. They would look at me, this 20, 21 year old. And, but anyway, I got, I learned, and then I was, I was still studying marketing. I was still going to school at night. And, so, and a, the Rothschilds, the European Rothschilds had set up a company here, uh, and they had set up a fund called the Five Arrows Fund. It reflected the five Rothschild families. And the portfolio manager needed somebody to assist, and somehow my name came up. And so I went to apply, and again, you see luck, persistence. The person who interviewed me, his name was Larry Harris. He was an NYU graduate. So he said, oh good, you're at NYU. It helps to get somebody, you know, gone to your school. And he said, yep, you got this job, but you're going to be interviewed by our chief financial officer, who also had gone to an MBA at NYU, but he's a CPA, an accountant, he's going to ask you technical questions. And this is the answers you should give him. So he gave me a, so fortunately I got on the tutor. <laughs> so I've always been helped by people to give me some lessons. So Stanley Glass asked me the questions, I answered him, I got the job. And I think less than five years back, he was reporting to me. I became the chief financial officer. But I was, by this time, I had graduated from NYU in marketing. That's great. So there's a pattern emerging here. So you go from being... Pattern is not telling the truth, I think. <laughs> well, you, or it's... improvising, yeah. Improvising, persistence, confidence. Um, so you go from being a bookkeeper to a financial analyst to being the Rothschild's uh, uh, chief financial person. You, you move to uh, your own business, you connect with Bloomingdale's. How did you then get to Ethan Allen and arrive uh, to where you are today? Well, when I, Ethan Allen's headquarters used to be in, um, in Manhattan, and one of my associates at Rothschild knew that I was selling these accessories because now I had more, more customers, Bloomingdale's, uh, the UN gift shop, and a few others. Uh, some designers I was selling to. And so he said, my family knows the founder of Ethan Allen. Would you like to meet with him? So, of course, I had never had no idea what Ethan Allen was. I went there, and it's on, on Lexington and 33rd, and the chairman had a big 3,000, 4,000 square foot office, very imposing. He'd gotten one of his merchants and said, this young man is from Kashmir. Do we get anything from there? She said, yes, we get this hand embroidered fabric called cruel fabric, never comes on time, always a problem. So he looked at me and said, you can help? I said, absolutely, I had no idea. <laughs> so I started my next adventure. So they gave me samples, I sent it to Kashmir, they made, long story, I had to go to North Carolina to get, uh, to get it uh, approved, and, uh, and I got into the business of selling fabrics. There were some ups and downs, but then after Ethan Allen, I said, if it's Ethan Allen, why not others? Keep in mind, I'm still working at the Rothschild. 
was all a part-time business. And then after a couple of years, Nat and Sal, who was again, so Ethan Allen is an 86-year company now. Keep in mind, it's sort of remarkable that this company that had only two CEOs, Nat and Sal and myself. And Nat and Sal uh, then uh, asked me, uh, called me again after a year, said, you know, we're having trouble getting rugs from Romania and India. You think you can help? And I said, absolutely. I had no idea where Romania was on the map, and <laughs> India had no idea where to go. So I decided to ask our family members in Kashmir where to go to India. And they said, you got to go to Agra. We know some family there. I went to, I took a week off. So I went to Agra with some samples. They said, no, not here. You got to go to Benares South. I went there, found somebody. So I started a business of supplying rugs to India, to Ethan Allen. And didn't go to Romania. And then, um, a year, I came to know uh, the founder, and he said to me after a year or so, he said, you're, you're a merchant. Why are you working on Wall Street? Come and join us. And I said, you know, then my next move has got to be running my own business, and how about a joint venture? So he said, what? <laughs> so, so I came with a proposal that we'll, I'll give up my job. I had a nice job, and um, that I, we would set up a company, and I called it KEA, this Kathwari Ethan Allen, that was called, and that it would develop products for Ethan Allen from around the world. At that time, Ethan Allen had about 30 manufacturing plants making furniture, but its franchisees, that's what was a franchise, purchased all their other products, like accessories, lighting, textile, rugs, from others. And so I suggested that I'll give my job, set up this company called KEA, and I'll go around the world developing products for Ethan Allen. And he agreed. And what year was that? When was that? That was in 1973. And for seven or eight years, nine years, we developed it. I set up offices. A number of Italy was at that time the major source of products, not China or you know the countries we have today. So I set up an office in Florence, Italy and then set up a place in Hong Kong, of course, in India, developed a lot of business, and in fact went to China. I went to China in 1975, just to see what was happening there, and started doing some business. And by the early 80s, the company had done well, and Ethan Allen was a public company. And by the early 80s, it had been acquired by a company in St. Louis called Interco. Those days, conglomerates were the fashion, so this company had Florsheim shoes, Converse shoes, some London Fox. So they were in the uh, apparel business, uh, footwear business. They wanted to go into the furniture business, and they purchased three major companies, Ethan Allen, Broyhill, and Lane, and became the largest furniture company in the United States. And so he, they said, he said that, you know, I want you to come to Danbury. At that, by that time, Ethan Allen had moved to Danbury, Connecticut. And so I said, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I don't want to do this. So he asked me what would motivate you to do it. I said, I, the only, only one reason would be, and I thought he would just say, forget it, is to take your job. And I thought he'd say, forget it. So he said, well, I can't promise it, but if you come here, you'll have that. I said, okay, if I don't get it, I won't stay. But anyway, I agreed to go. And in about four, less than four years, I did take his, I became the president of the company. So that was 1985. 1985, yeah. And all of a sudden you're running this big, iconic American company. What was the first thing you thought needed to happen, and how did you begin to uh, take the reins of this big company? Well, Ethan Allen uh, was very well known. It was known for early American colonial, uh, these, the two entrepreneurs from New York. In 1932, Nat and Sal and his brother-in-law had gone to Vermont. They purchased a mill right in the northeastern Vermont called the New, um, the, 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 the New Kingdom. And there they started making uh, furniture. And it grew. In the 1930s, they established, uh, they were pioneers. At that, by that, in the 1930s, most furniture was sold like a commodity, like we see washers and dryers. So they convinced a lot of stores like Macy's and Altman's and others to establish what they call Ethan Allen galleries. 
So the name came to be known. So they had a good marketing concept. And 30s, 40s, they also developed a lot of manufacturing. They purchased more plants, established more plants. And, um, but, the manuf but it was a manufacturing company. And the culture of those days was basically that, uh, you know, the management style was, it's my way or the highway. And if it ain't broken, don't fix it. So when I came in, I started seeing that we had a great opportunity because Ethan Allen was a manufacturer with franchises that operated not much different than, uh, you know, like the car dealers who have a number of franchises, each one operating, each one advertising separately. Like they, they will say, come and get it from me. I thought we had an opportunity of creating a national brand. And the first one was to convincing all the franchisees, which was not easy. The bigger ones didn't want to do it. They had an advantage. The bigger ones, especially in the East Coast, uh, right up to Chicago, had an advantage. They were closer to the manufacturing. Most of the manufacturing was in from New England to New York to North Carolina. There were one or two plants, one was in Oklahoma, one was in California, but most was here. And they didn't want to share the benefits with other dealers. So, um, you know, I was also influenced being a student of history in Kashmir, whatever little I studied, which is American history. So I was somewhat influenced by the American history. So in 1985, I came with this idea that we would make the motto of Benjamin Franklin our motto. That is, if you don't, if you don't hang together, we'll hang separately. So they said, what's crazy stuff you're talking of hanging? So it took us, it was not an easy thing, but one of the major challenges was, which is logistics in our business, delivering products from the East Coast to the West Coast. If you don't control it, that co it, could be, it would cost you 20% more. So we decided that uh, we would attack something that has not been done and still is not done, that we will take over all the logistics of delivering our products all over the country at one cost. They said it cannot be done. And I looked at all the numbers and they said every time we will deliver perhaps say west of the Mississippi or Texas will lose money. I said, but will we make money if we deliver to on the eastern US? They said, yes. I said, okay, let's average it out. I don't want to see any numbers that show losses because then I will make the wrong decision. So I don't want to study it. I, said, I wanted to know the bottom line. We said, if we deliver it, and we can convince all our franchises to go with it, this will be a good move. Now, not easy because a number of our franchises in the East Coast got together, banded together. They called me Robin Hood. That you're taking from us and giving to the folks in the West. So I had a lot of battles. It was not easy. But I convinced them. Persistence is an important factor. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I also had to develop a number of them as my partners. It doesn't happen. So very important. Certainly all the folks from the west of the Mississippi became more of my friends than the ones in the east, but finally all did. And a couple of our big dealers left us, franchises left us. So you had to pay a price. Anything important you've got to be willing to lose. So that has also been part of my, somewhat of a background. And by the 1980s, we had created to a great degree one national brand with one advertising, delivering our products at one cost nationally. You were telling me that uh, a lot of the uh, development of leadership came from within the company. Um, give a little flavor of how did you go about doing that, and, and a, a significant percentage of the leaders you created were women from within the company. How did, the, how did you do it? Well, the first is when I got involved, well, you know, keep in mind, in, by the 80s, 85, when I became president, uh, we had tremendous amount of manufacturing in Maine, in Vermont, in Massachusetts, upstate New York. I don't think they'd ever met a Farouk before, especially in New So when the first time I went there, you have to be, people have to feel comfortable with you. It doesn't matter what it is. You've got to relate to people. I remember going first, I've been there, but now I'm the president of the company. So our president who's now become vice chair is from New England, a great person, and he introduces me. So there are 2,000 of them <clears throat> watching me. I said, you know, you must be wondering about me, but let me tell you this. I also came and grew up in the mountains. You are in the green mountains. I came in the mountains of Kashmir. I shouldn't tell you this, but in Kashmir, we would consider these small hills here. So they looked at me. But I said, but there is something in common. 
we have a saying that is common, which is that most of the problems of the world have been created by flatlanders. They said, yes, we agree. In other words, you've got to get people, you've got to associate with people. Now the management, now we had to make some changes. We had to, even for instance, our uh, franchisees, and I'll come back to our, uh, this question of leadership, they felt that they knew more about products than we, when we were telling them that they've got to buy only products from Ethan Allen. So I think it was in 1986 or so, I said to them that I would like to have a conference, which is what you attended. You just attended that conference, but it first one held, was held in 1986, but all of the designers, interior designers, were working for our franchisees. We paid for them. I said, I want to pay, I want to listen to them. We've got 600 of them coming in at that time. And they understood what we were doing. And they, were the, they went back to, to their franchises telling, telling them that what we are suggesting made sense. Now, we had also an issue with our manufacturing, our management structure. It was, you know, we had about, I don't know, maybe 40 vice presidents at that time. A smaller company, but it was a very bureaucratic. That's how it was. It was a manufacturing company. So I remember going up in Vermont, and, one, and we used to have a video newsletter. So our people had seen these designers coming in. And one of our persons stopped me in, in, in Vermont and said, you know, you're getting all these designers. What about us? No, these are factory people. So I asked our management there. I said, what about if we close this place? We had about 800 people there. What will happen for two days? They said, disaster. I said, how, how long will we get the benefit if all these people are motivated and come back? Somebody said three months, somebody said six months. I said, I have no investment. I know that I get a return in six months. So I invited 5,000 of our factory workers to come to Danbury, Connecticut, where you were, in three, 400 at a time. So we had to create a culture. And one of the things I mentioned to them, and again, this is part of my sort of upbringing, history, background, and I told them that the main job of a leader, this is when I, they were coming there, the main job of a leader is to help their people become better. And if they don't help you, you have a, you have a right to revolt. So our management said, you're crazy? You're telling them to revolt against us? I said, no, only if you don't help them. Well, 70% of our management at that time needed to retire. So this was a good way of helping them retire. Because now they were being pushed by their people. They said, enough. So now we give an opportunity to bring the people up. So we created a completely new management right from the ground up in manufacturing. We had 5,000 people at that time in manufacturing. Then the next one came in the 90s when many of our franchises were retiring. They started retiring. And many of their children didn't want to be in the business. So we decided that we would get up and run the retail ourselves. And the question was, who would run it? The French families have a different perspective. So we felt that the best person to run anything is a person who's got passion. In our business, interior designers have the passion because we're in the business of design. So we decided that we would start getting interior designers into leadership position. And uh, it took a number of years. It was not an easy thing to do because we didn't have management. I even mentioned that the cricket thing that you know, we decided at one time to cr create cricket teams within our whole network to see who will rise up. In the retail, when we had about 100 stores, we went from zero. And I had to myself also, you know, sort of uh, work to, with our families to acquire them. We decided that we would get our interior designers to become managers. Well, it was a long-term thing because if you're thinking of short-term, you wouldn't have done it. But 10, 15, 20 years later, we have now 200 management people, and you would think they've gone to an MBA program. And they're all basically came with almost all of them with an interior design background. Now, every interior designer didn't make it. We have, you know, 1,500 interior designers that work for us, but 200 of our management have come from there. And as you've said, about 80% are women, because that was, you know, most of the interior designers were women. That's great. It's really such an interesting example of how you build from within and how you create opportunities for women. 
uh, in so many industries now, people say we can't find qualified women. Well, here you found them within your own ranks. And as you say, these were people passionate about the business and they were able to make that transformation. Yes, not everybody could make it, but you got to create a situation that where you, you got to help people. You got to first see that there's a talent, you got to help them. And then you got to also understand that it's going to take a little time. If on the other hand, you were just looking for short term, you'd say, get a headhunter, get somebody from who's the, who at that time the most qualified person. But we were thinking long term, how to create a team that would long term be able to work together. Now, they're still learning, you know, but we have 200 strong and more coming up. One of the things that is interesting to me about your approach and your background, there aren't many CEOs of big companies who would have a list of attributes or principles that would include the word justice. Um, I, one of the things you told me about is that when you've open manufacturing facilities in Mexico and Honduras, um, you made a point of saying, we're going to follow not the law of Mexico or Honduras, we're going to apply the same environmental human rights standards that we do at home. Say something about why justice is on your list of 10 attributes of leadership. Well, first, you know, in, when I became president, and before that, I was thinking about it, that, you know, we all have to operate under certain principles. And, you know, I've also seen the other side of when people are not treated fairly, what happens. I've seen lots and lots of problems, how families have been uh, disunited and how motivated people can do great things. So, um, I also thought about is what should the principles be? So, I consulted with some of my team members, but also our, our uh, principles, I, we developed them in the, in the 80s. They are on our website. They call our leadership principles. There are ten of them. It's common sense principles. First one is hard work. Leaders must work hard. How are we going to ask your people to work hard if you don't set the example? Second, I mean, these are not in the order. Is relative importance of priorities. We're all confronted with what to do. So, at Ethan Allen, uh, over the years now, I developed it that I don't want to hear more than five at any time. So I want everybody to tell me only five things they can do, because even that's a lot. Third is speed. I follow the U.S. Marines in that, where they say, if you're 70% ready, go. You're now going to be 100% ready. So speed is critical, but you've got to be 70. That's our leadership responsibility. You, it's a judgment. You never know you're completely 70, but going into 50% ready is not good. And trying to go to 90%, you'll never do it. So that's a balancing act. So one of our principles is speed. Uh, then uh, the, uh, the last one I will mention is, the ten of them, is the word justice. Now, it's not used in business, but justice is dealing people with fairly. I mean, mo that's very important. You, it does not mean that you're going, you're going to give things away. You're going to make sure that you are constantly doing things which are going to help people. For instance, um, Hardly anybody leaves Ethan Allen. You know, you know that you've met lots of our folks. Uh, in, uh, in, in, you know, these are major, major costs. We have 5,000 people. We got to, we pay all the medical costs. That's one of our biggest challenges. Environmental costs are major. We run manufacturing. And we run manufacturing in Vermont. Vermont is something like California, not easy. So you've got to meet, but we have consistently said that you've got to invest in these things because if you don't, you never catch up. And so we have followed environmental policy. We get more awards from the EPA than most companies because EPA generally finds you. Now, for, and concept of justice was also when we went to, for instance, Mexico about 10 years back, we were having trouble in finding folks who would sew and cut fabric in the United States. It's the lost art. We could have gone Southeast Asia. We said, no, we want to own it. So we went to Mexico, Central Mexico, a great place, a state called Guanajuato. The Guanajuato cities and the, uh, and the, U, the UN, one of those heritage cities, great place. And the small plant at that time, 30, 40,000 square feet, 90 people, run by an American former Air Force officer who had taken his family and living in Mexico. Anyway, we purchased it. And we said, we will follow environmental policies of Vermont. They said, not needed. I said, 
do it. Well, now, 10 years later, we have 900 people there. We have 600,000 square feet. And everyone over there knows that they are treating with dignity and fairly. Because they know that if we can get away with environmental laws, we'll save us some money. But the benefit of having motivated people is greater than that uh, little, little money that we would have, a lot of money at that time. But the benefit, same thing in Honduras. Honduras is not an easy country. We, went, we bought a place which was empty, uh, and uh, it was built as a furniture plant, but no business. So now we have 500 people there, and it's the only manufacturing plant, uh, in, in this case, run by a woman from Honduras. Normally, you would not have it. Uh, she was, that was not her background, but she's doing a great job. Uh, but so you have to uh, make sure that we, for instance, in Mexico and in Honduras, we can afford we have health clinics. We treat not only our employees, we treat their families. Because over there, if, a, if a somebody is sick, there are no facilities, they'll be out for five days. But we can also afford it. So when we did that in Mexico and in Honduras, folks in North Carolina told me, why not us? First I said, you know, you got, it's, a, it's, it's a different situation. But we ended up having health clinics in North Carolina and in Vermont. We don't have physicians, but we have you know, nurse practitioners and others uh, in those facilities as well. I want to get some questions from the audience, but I want to ask you just two things about your life outside of Ethan Allen. Uh, one, one thing that really strikes me, we're, <clears throat> we're living in strange times now, and in a way, you personify, you're, you've been running for all these years a kind of iconic American brand, and yet here you are, a guy who came from South Asia, you're a Muslim American, and we're at a place in our country where people are, have demonized uh, foreigners, uh, Muslims. How, how personally and professionally and in terms of your life do you, do you react to that? And what are the things that you can do and what can we do? Well, uh, first, you know, I must say this, that I'm involved in a lot of things. But when I first came to, when I landed in New York, the first major challenge was the subway system. Because I'd never, <laughs> never gone under, in a train. Kashmir has no trains. And going underground was saying, how can you live? But also when I looked around, I saw these are folks. They're people, ordinary people. They're like us. So I got to tell you this personally. I have never felt any different. If somebody has, maybe, but I, I've, nobody has shown me that they somehow feel different about me. I have never felt any different from the day I landed, a week later, I said, I'm an American. Of course, I came from an area of conflict. I said, forget it. This is a place that, that nobody was stopping me. There were lights were on, all that stuff. I have personally felt that, well, this is an attitude, I believe, also. As I did not feel any different, I was not looked upon any differently. And keep in mind, when I was working on Wall Street in the 19, late 60s, uh, you could maybe see one person from South Asia in a month, maybe. So um, that was, so I felt, I did not, I, I've always felt that to a great degree, of course there are people maybe thinking differently, but we also create our own problems. So that, so I've never felt in my, uh, in my involvement in, with anybody as far as the religion is concerned, I've never felt any different, you know, I've taught Again, as you know, there's a lot, lot of different perspectives of every religion. People don't understand the diversity of thinking in any, every religion is so great. They think that maybe every Muslim thinks the same, every Catholic thinks the same way, every... That's not the case. Uh, we were taught when we were in Kashmir that Islam means submission. And, you, it, and submission is to goodness. And that's what it meant. It said you've got to be a good person. Everything else didn't matter. That's what we were taught. And that's what a lot of people are taught. But unfortunately, you know, as times have gone by, it has become more radicalized, politicized, and all that stuff. So I have never felt. But having said this, I felt that if I can contribute, I must. And when well, first opportunity came in the 90s, when the situation in Kashmir became very difficult and bad, so I was actually um, asked indirectly and then directly by both the, leader, the leaders of both India and Pakistan 
and also some Kashmiri leaders to get involved. So I, I went there first at the request of the Indian government. At that time, most of the Kashmiri leaders were in jails. So I saw them in the jails. And I came back and I said, you know, point that is such a major point of difference. We got to bring something in common. And I, I couldn't do this myself. So I set up being a marketing person. You got to create a brand and the brand has to be known. And then it's got to be desired that the brand is not going to go anywhere. So as you know, I was able to get together 24 of the leading scholars and former ambassadors, think tank presidents, even some members of Congress, and we formed a Kashmir study group. And that, and then we sent a team to both to India and Pakistan and to the region of Kashmir, and they came with a report, a very lengthy report. It said something about uh, Kashmir dispute at 50. The objective was to create a brand. And interestingly, only a year, year and a half later, I was asked by both the leaders of India and Pakistan to get involved. And then they, it's now public, they sent two of their very senior people, head of their military and head of their um, uh, State Department, uh, their foreign affairs. We have a farm upstate in New York called, it's in Livingston, New York. So I'm a part-time farmer, so... We took them, four of them, along with a number of our people, to Livingston, New York, and after a number of discussions, came with a proposal called the Livingston Proposal. It's online under Kashmir Study Group. The objective was to find a solution. I, when I was younger, I had more radical ideas of what Kashmir should be. And I felt that, you know, everybody should leave us right away. And later on, I came to the conclusion that both India and Pakistan are not going to leave you. And now I have to convince others how to come with a sensible way, because the only thing I saw was Kashmiris were being under great stress, trouble, getting killed, and they didn't have an option. So you had to come with options, and we came under three marketing terminologies. One said it should be peaceful, common sense. Second, anything we do, any solution should be honorable. And third, it should be feasible. That's an important one. So I spent 10 years traveling back and forth, convincing everybody, came with lots of ideas, stopped some conflicts and things of the nature, but the problem is still on. Yeah. However, the objective was to come with a, and I think this applies to a lot of problems. That is, uh, you know, people get so hung up. And in this case, we had meetings in, in India, in Pakistan, in Kathmandu, in Switzerland, all kinds of places. You have read some of the reports. Yeah. And uh, it was remarkable that people did get together, but then external factors came in. Still issues, they still haven't come as close. But certainly at least there were ideas that could work. So with that, uh, Michael, then, because I had to get involved with that, then I had to get involved with a lot of other things. I'm going to ask you about just one of those other things, and then we're going to take questions from yeah. the group. Um, I noticed the other day um, uh, that we've... Uh, our, our, re our commitment in the United States to refugees has diminished greatly. Uh, in his last year in office, uh, President Obama put forward a notion, a goal of taking 110,000 refugees. In the first six months of this year, we've taken eight. Uh, in a moment where there are 20 million refugees in the world and another 40 million internally displaced, you were the head of, chaired the board of Refugees International. You've been on the board of the International Rescue Committee. I know you care about these issues. What do you say to people now as we think about America's role in protecting these most vulnerable people? You know, this morning, I had the great pleasure of being informed that, um, that I've, I've been sort of, uh, I'm receiving the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, which is such a great privilege. So when I... When I did that, when I read that, I was looking at, I don't know if I have it with me, let's see. Yeah, I do. So I was looking at the Medal of Honor, and they have a statement uh, on, their, on this, on this uh, Medal of Honor statement about this position that you just said. Didn't I, it, I was not thinking of that, but it said, America, what's the role of America? This person said, he said, I had always hoped that this land might become a safe and agreeable asylum 
to the virtuous and persecuted people, uh, persecuted part of mankind, to whatever nation they might belong. Guess who said it? George Washington. Right? George Washington said this. Yeah. Uh, this is in, he, was, he also got, of course, uh, uh, I know when they gave it recently, he also got this medal. But this is a statement that they took it and put it on. That what should be, what is this nation about? Now, I also agree that over the years, and all the folks who cry about it, they, are, they have created the problems. Like, for instance, allowing a lot of illegal people coming in. But the people who allowed them because they wanted cheap labor to work in the farms, to work in the restaurants, to work in the streets. So it was okay. As now they, the same people say we don't want them, but they let them come in. So we got to find a sensible way of this. I worked like even from 2010 to 2014 also with President Obama. I was an advisory, um, what do you call those, um, councils. Uh, and one of the things that got me involved was the refugees issues. I mean, it's a tough, tough issue. I think that, you know, when we have a situation, you got to look at both sides. To see how do you first you got to curtail in my view because there are a lot of people who are against the fact of illegals coming in any country would do that but then i think we got to find a solution of the people who are here because hard to throw them out third i think we should continue this is a land of immigrants this Alice island this way they gave it they gave it to because of the, they're giving it because of the fact of and they're giving it not to new immigrants, they gave it to George Washington too. They gave it to him too. So I think that uh, there is, we got to balance it. Because right now, we've gone too far on the other side. I agree with that. Uh, thoughts from the audience. There's mics at your desk, so just speak up and identify yourself. I want to get some audience participation, please. Yeah. Right, please. Yes. Hi, I'm Mary. I graduated from the executive MBA uh, last year. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that a lot of business leaders won't speak about politics. And I, I imagine that your business is going to take a hit if there's uh, broad tariffs that are coming. And according to some like powerful industry insiders, that's a real possibility. Um, so I'm just wondering, how do you handle the lack of, of, you know, some people will speak out, Jamie Dimon and whatnot, but there's, there's a, it feels that corporate leaders could be way more vocal, especially now, uh, and I, take a little bit more control of the political situation. What do you have to say about that? No, I agree. You know, I mean, last about 2016, I had given a lot of, lot of thought. I was approached by the American Jewish Committee. They wanted to establish a, advise, a council, which is called the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council. And they asked me if I could co-chair with Stanley Bergman, who runs a company called Henry Schein. Now, I had a tough time because Henry Schein is a $12 billion company, but people don't know it. Ethan Allen, everybody knows. So I had to think about what would be the impact of doing this in North Carolina, in Oklahoma, in Alabama, in all these places that I'm in. So I got involved. In fact, next week uh, we are having a reception in, uh, in Washington where Senator Grassley and Senator Feinstein, one is a Democrat and a Republican, they have co-sponsored a, 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 a bill of, uh, against hate against hate crimes. So we're able to get them together. I think business leaders should get together, but they should try to do it in a, as much as possible in a manner of, get, of getting people together, not make it so that you divide people. We did this, not easy, but if you are able to do it in a manner that, that all these issues that we have are issues that can be done in a manner that not, not politicize it, but to speak like all the things that we are doing. Uh, we have gotten, uh, we have uh, members that are Republicans, Independents, Democrats. So you've got to watch it, but certainly we are talking about issues relating to refugees. We're talking about issues relating to hate crimes, or, uh, 
and we have, we have not seen any problems. And there, if there is a problem, it might, it, there are obviously there are some people who may not agree with it, but it has not been vocal. Okay. Yes, please. How did you handle, uh, over the course of your tenure, uh, your relationship with, uh, between your values and the market? Professor Buchanan was talking about long-termism, and uh, we heard inspiring stories about um, imposing environmental laws and standards in places where there was not needed. No, it's, it's a big challenge. We're a public company. I was last week um, in uh, Orlando speaking at a Raymond James, they have an annual conference, and you know, I go to these analyst meetings too. So it is a challenge, where, but so far, our overall performance has been good. If on the other hand, if you don't have a good performance, and then you do these things, then it could be even a greater challenge. So you've got to, be, you've got to make sure that you, as long, that you run the business, but the business has to be run also for reasonable profits or adequate profits. If you don't do that, then, you don't, then you're not going to have, um, have, it won't be good either from your stockholders or from your employees or your customers. So it's, a, it's a balancing act and not easy. And, you know, I've been doing this for a long, long time. Um, we did have, a few years back, uh, an activist investor came in and said, you know, uh, we believe that you own too many properties, of our factories, many stores, you should sell them and give the money out. Now, short term, that'll be great. The two or three years later, the company could get bankrupt, but these folks don't care. Now, as you know, this is a big issue taking place. So I thought about it and, of course, consulted with our board of directors. We have a very engaged board, very knowledgeable, and came to the conclusion that, you know, I don't, li I don't like threats. Never had in my life. I said, nope, we're not going to do this a free country. So they went and they said, we'll have a proxy war. We're going to put our board. You know, so we said, do it if that's what you want to do, but we're not going to give in. And so there was a battle. It was written up on Wall Street Journal and, you know, because what these folks do is they, go, they try to demonize you. They go to places where you are. They run a public relations campaign, the worst possible, but they lost. So you've got to fight it. If I didn't want to compromise because I said I'm not going to run this company if it's not run in the values I believe are, are there. Our stockholders agreed. But you also have to perform. It's a balancing act. Hi, Mara Serbu. I'm in the Langone program. Um, I really appreciated your story about immigrating to this country and, and becoming a, an American and, and the values that you learned. Um, I'm, my family and I immigrated from Romania, so I'm a little disappointed you didn't find the rugs no, there. No, we have an Ethan Allen in Romania. <laughs> okay. By the way, I did go there. We have, okay. a, we have an Ethan Allen in Bucharest. Okay, good. Okay, Fine. yeah. Thank God. That was my question. No. Um, but I'm curious to hear more about what you think the role of business is in addressing the refugee crisis, because I think, you know, as a person in a position of power, you can um, do things in your personal capacity, but as, as a business leader, what do you think um, corporate America should be doing to address this issue? As I said, you know, the, it's, it's a complex situation. I think that we have to make sure that we also understand the issues from all sides. We just don't only think about the fact what we are thinking. We got to think about what, what are, why are the people concerned in Ohio? Why are they concerned in Oklahoma? Why are they concerned in Colorado? We may have one perspective that we may think living in California, New York, that's the whole world. That's not. So we've got to understand their perspectives. I think that, and again, as I said, their perspectives also have uh, vested interests. All the, all the folks in the Midwest and the Far West, when they were, it was okay for them to get cheap labor. But as long, but then when it comes to the situation of, um, and it was okay to get cheap labor and even illegal, uh, and then they also oppose it when it's convenient. I think my perspective is, as business leaders, we should speak up about the fact of the values of this country. And that's why I said what George Washington said. This country is based upon the fact people came from all over. 
we we are the one we are america all throughout all these ages and, and it's our responsibility to get that message out now i know there are concerns you know uh, when 20 years back when we didn't have as many people who are of hispanic origin or asian origin the concern was less people don't speak about it but those are concerns people are concerned about the fact of which how much of the demographic uh, demographic is changing of the united states this is a concern and we got to understand it but then i think the message has got to be that the most of the people almost the vast vast majority of people who come to america are hard working people they contribute we should not put the few that that had that have problems and associate them with the vast majority so the leaders business the leaders responsibility is to get that message across but i think we need to make sure that we look at our laws we need to strengthen this question of illegal immigrants coming in because that's an issue but we also have to now take into account the people who are already here to find a solution for them i think business leaders should talk about sensible practical i think the thing what i'm saying i think will be accepted in wisconsin and ohio as in new york if you say it that way right, we maybe have time for one more question all right well why don't we Farooq, um, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you here. And I, you know, I think one of the things, um, we teach a lot of technical skills in the business school, or people do. Um, what, what you represent really is uh, business leadership and the combination of good judgment and good ability to run a big company and run it successfully, but merge that with personal values that really are the hallmark of leadership. So we're really proud to have you in the Stern family, proud to have you here. And I want to thank you for being here with us today and thank everybody for coming. Thank you. you know, it, it's my real, real pleasure. You know, and I always come back and say, you know, when I was studying, I didn't study that much because I didn't have the time. <laughs> but now I have an opportunity of coming here and uh, the great opportunity last year of speaking at your convocation also and uh, but that's america you know think of it when i came i think i had 37 dollars well anyway thank you thank you and thanks everybody for being here Fruk and mike thank you both so much there's a reception next door and we actually have these little nyu gifts for each of you so thank you for being here with us if you will, thank you <laughs> thank you, thank you.